So uh, welcome everybody. We have, uh, uh, you know, we always have a big agenda, so I'm just going to stop saying that, but we've got, uh, we've got the normal things we're going to talk about today. Um, and that includes, sorry, just finding my notes here. That includes, um, of course, we're going to go over and talk about um, the slot updates. Um, so that is where I read some of the uh, the mailbag uh, questions that come in and then some of the just the um, education reports that they put out, um, you know, several times a week. Uh, I share those with you just so you become more comfortable with this idea of, you know, what's going on with, with your IRAs and how are they structured and um, what are the implications of doing different things. And a lot of this is, of course, repetition. People write in with the with similar questions, but, you know, that's good because you keep hearing these things and um, you remember why you're doing what you need to do in your portfolios and your uh, and total investment plan and why that's important. Uh, then we're going to go over some market updates and uh, analyst reports. We're going to spend a lot of time on one report in particular today from Prudential that I thought was really, really good. Um, I don't really have much by way of market updates other than the markets were down last week. Um, you know, Tuesdays coming off of a holiday are really difficult because I don't have all of my data yet. I usually get my um, my data from uh, either Invesco or First Trust or whomever it comes from. Um, and uh, that uh, they give a nice compiled report of all the different indices that would frankly take me hours to put together. So uh, I don't have those. I often don't have those on Tuesday mornings. Uh, I'll keep an eye out in my, in my email box uh, to see if we have it pop in, but um, I usually don't get them until late Tuesday or early um, Wednesday. In fact, I just got BlackRock's um, analyst report in my mailbox right now. So they're not included in this week's um, analysts haven't had a chance to read it. So everybody's about a day behind. So anyway, um, we all know that the markets have been down. It's it's an overall down, which is difficult, right? Stocks are down, bonds are down. And that's, that's uh, this is what I've been talking to you about from the beginning of, uh, you know, the, the, um, the rise out of the pandemic is that, um, you know, we, we really have to be, this is what concerns me, right? There are times when the stock market's down, the bond markets are down as interest rates are increasing. We all know that interest rates have to increase. Consumer price index is much higher than I think anybody anticipated. Seven and a half percent year over year um, as of the January numbers. That's a huge number that's unsustainable um, for anybody. And uh, even, even if some of the, um, you know, the experts of what they're saying, four and a half, Five percent over a period of time will be really damaging to a lot of financial plans. So there's a lot of concerns out there. I'm feeling it, you're feeling it, and the world is really feeling it. And that's why we see the activity that we see in the markets. So we'll go over some analyst reports. There's there. I told you uh, at the end of last year that I thought that uh, maybe the beginning of the year that I thought that the markets are going to um, end either flat, slightly up, or slightly down, maybe five percent down four or five percent up either way. Um, you know, we've experienced 18% year over year for the past three years, or an average, I should say, uh, for the S&P 500. And I don't think that we're going to uh, see anything near that this year. I hope I'm wrong. But we've got to build that foundation. You've heard me talk about it a million times now, build that foundation of asset allocation, principal protection, and uh, account segmentation. Um, it's interesting. I was watching a video this morning from a fella, and I, I don't recall his name. It's the first time I've seen him, but he's got about 44,000 followers on YouTube, so I'll have to go and look at some of his information. But he was talking about the bucket theory, which is you know how to spread out your assets during retirement so that you're not drawing from volatile assets early on. And that's, um, of course, account segmentation is much um, much more broadly played out than just two or three buckets um, but, uh, he's, you know, he had some interesting thoughts about how, why that wouldn't work. And, and what I saw out of that video is that what he's not taking into account is, um, investor behavior and the psychology behind part of, uh, investing. Um, you know, you, you can mathematically things can make sense, but then behaviorally things get blown up by the actions of individuals. And, and looking back, people know that it wasn't the right move. And they even going into it, sometimes they feel like it's not the right move. But I saw in the Great Recession, I saw very, very smart people stop making contributions to their 401ks. Boy, you know, terrible. They had the means. It's not like they couldn't afford to do it. 
they just were afraid to do it because they kept seeing their values go down. Looking back now, that was one of the best times to invest, right? Um, so people, people make judgmental mistakes based on their feelings. And that's just as viable as intellectual decisions. And that has to be taken into account. So that is what this fellow it was is missing, I believe. So maybe I'll see if we can have a conversation about that um, with this um, with this fellow. So, uh, and then we're going to have our fin financial planning topic. And I want to be honest with you, folks. There are times when I've got my financial planning topics laid out, you you know, week after week after week, and they all kind of come together. And there are times like this week we have a lot of activity, a lot of things going on. You all know that we're we have. Number one, we're finishing up reno renovations at the office. And uh, we are open for business, by the way. The office, Jessica, is in there today. She was in there a few days last week. The bottom floor is we had cleaners come in and they, they did a deep clean because, you know, everything was covered with construction dust. And you look at it and you think, boy, are we ever going to be able to be in here again? And it is beautiful in there. So the bottom floor is 100% finished. And we're running. Conference room is running. You know, pencils are in the pencil or, or pens are in the pen uh, cases. Everything's good. I checked the TV yesterday to make sure it still works. Everything's good. The top floor, we're almost there. We had our final electrical inspection yesterday. Our final inspection, I think, is scheduled for next week. The cleaners are scheduled for next week. The painting's almost all done. And uh, that's very exciting. So there's going to be just some small things that have to be done up there, some furnishings, some pictures, you know, kind of the fun stuff. Um, so, um, but we're open for business and that's exciting. So we'll be able to start seeing you folks face to face. If you want to meet face to face, we're going to start with two days a week, Wednesdays and Thursdays, um, and then branch out from there. So that's exciting. A lot, a lot going on there. I spent about four hours there yesterday morning meeting with contractor inspection sitting at, you know, I'm I had to sit at Jess's desk because I, I'm still the only one at the office since we bought it in 2019, the end of 2019, that doesn't have an office there. <laughs> so I, I had to work in a conference room or grab another desk. Um, I, I, uh, I have an office tucked in the corner in the back first floor, but I never got a chance to set it up because of everything COVID. Um, and now I'll be on the second floor. So we have to wait for that to be done. But um the point being that we're going to start seeing people there and that's exciting. So that's a lot of that is going on. And then we're doing this transition for our clients, really, really strong, great transition for our clients and our firm. And we're moving. Um, we, we ended the affiliation with Kestra Financial, NFP and Kestra. Um, they started as NFP. They were great partners for many years. Just made sense for us to go in a different direction as a standalone registered investment advisory group. So I think you all know we got our um, SEC um, uh approval, I don't know, mid-January, and um, and we're starting to transfer our clients' accounts to Schwab as custodian. I think Schwab's going to be a great partner, by the way, of reducing costs for our clients, increasing um, availabilities, and um, uh, technology, certainly. Uh, I'm really impressed with their technology, and they bought TD Ameritrade, and I know, because I have some, my H HSAs are through TD Ameritrade, they're um, technology is knocked out. So all that's going on. Um, so my point, but what I was saying was there are times when I know that I, exactly for weeks over weeks, what I'm going to talk about with financial planning. And sometimes I just don't know uh, until uh, sometimes, uh, honestly, it doesn't happen often, but you know, I usually get up at 6 a.m. And sometimes at 6 a.m. I just don't know until I start going through my emails, reading, uh, you know, research reports or my, my financial planning association uh, logs. Often my ideas come from there, but many times they come from client experiences. So Joe, if you're listening, uh, this financial planning topic comes from you. And it, it occurred to me last night at about 10 o'clock as I was following up on some research for a client, we were transitioning. And that is, what are the different types of IRAs and what does it mean? So in, in our transition to Schwab, the question came up, well, wait a minute, I have a traditional IRA and now this is this is transferring over to a contributory IRA. Is that the right thing or should it be a rollover IRA? And what does that mean? So I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about it. And Joe, if you're listening, um, you saved my butt and, <laughs> and I appreciate it. So um, we have a lot coming up. 
So next, uh, the 3rd of March starts our Changing World of Retirement Planning webinar. That is next week already. Um, so you will be getting invitations to that today. I don't want to overlap emails too much. You've been getting a lot of invitations. Clients have been getting a lot of uh, information about our transition. You folks get, uh, you know, one or two emails from us a week. And then um, uh, you'll be getting the invitation to the Changing World of Retirement Planning webinar today. Feel free to share it. We already have about 50, 60 people, I guess, registered but from what I'm seeing, but it's a webinar. So we don't have to worry about classroom space. We don't have to worry about any of that. So feel free to share it. Uh, those of you that have um, uh, been through this class before, many of you have done it once, twice, three times, um, you, you know that it's really great material. It's going to be six hours over two nights. There's two series, two Thursdays, two Tuesdays, six hours, three hours each night. The invitation that went out, unfortunately, at two hours, you know how much I talk, so I can't do that class in two hours. It's three hours. Um, so that's coming up beginning next week. On March 16th, on our, for our special webinar, we have Sarah Brenner. Uh, Sarah is from the uh, Slot Advisory Group. She, uh, I don't recall her title, but I think she is in charge of the, um, the uh, analysts or the, that they call them. Sarah does a great job. She's an attorney who um, uh, has been with Slot for a long time since I've been involved, and she's kind of my go-to person. So we're going to talk about trusts as beneficiaries of IRAs. Um, David McKnight is joining us live on April 27th in Newtown, where there's going to be a VIP event just for you folks who join us every week on these webinars. Um, and that's going to be at the Newtown Theater, a really neat venue. Um, parking is going to be a little challenging. You park on the street and you park down the block a little bit. So I'm going to make sure that you know about that. But the Newtown Theater might be the oldest theater in the country now, if not one of the oldest theaters in the country. It's got a lot of connection with me. We've, I've been a business uh, partner there for several years. Um, we had my mother's 90th birthday party there. Um, it, uh, I used to go there when I was a kid. It's a really, really neat venue. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. So that's David McKnight, April 27th in Newtown. And if you listen to David and the McKnight's podcasts, and if you don't, you should. That's the Power of Zero podcast. I had a really nice surprise listening to the last podcast. So. Um, Two weeks ago, I was listening to the, the, the podcast, and I might have been listening a week ago because sometimes I catch up, and I heard Dave talking about a question about capital gains and does cap do capital gains affect Roth conversions, and that was a question that came in on the webinar that Dave and I did together. Dave and I, Dave was a guest on my webinar in January, and um, that was a question that came in before before. Um, beforehand about do capital gains affect my marginal tax bracket for Roth conversions. And we had a good conversation about that. And Dave used that for the podcast, uh, his podcast and talked about it. So I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, he didn't credit the webinar, but that's okay. But then I jumped on last week's webinar and uh, I heard Dave talk about a webinar that he did with Mark Bialik from Pennsylvania, Matterboro Wealth Management. And basically he's replaying the entire webinar on his podcast because, and he had contacted me and he, he told me how happy he was with, you know, the back and forth and um, the questions that came in and, you know, listen, Dave's a great guy. We've become friendly and he's a, he's a good partner and um, uh, you should be listening to this podcast, but definitely listen to this, the last one and next week's because, uh, and it might be actually this week's now, since it's this week's, uh, it's, it's a new week um, because, what he did was he took that webinar that we did over an hour and broke it up into two podcasts. So you get to hear your, my, you know, me and Dave talking about uh, the issues that are important to you. And I think that's really neat and really exciting. Obviously, Dave has a lot of followers on his uh, podcast, so um, I'm proud of that. Okay, so moving on. I didn't check in, but tell me if you can see me and hear me okay. Raise your hands, please. If you can see me and hear me okay. Great. Good to see you all. All right. Let's talk about some headlines. JP Morgan, uh, I saw last night and I forwarded uh, over. So I remember to talk to you about it today. JP Morgan now sees Fed hiking interest rates nine times to combat red hot inflation. We talked about the CPI being seven. So consumer price index that equals inflation being seven and a half percent year over year. That is a very, very high number, well above my expectation. 
Um, and I think well above anybody who sits on the Federal Reserve's um, board expectation. And I, I believe now they're wishing they would have started rate hikes earlier. Okay. So certainly some things come into play there. You know, we, we see what's happening in the markets right now. We have, you know, we've got the issue with Russia and Ukraine. We've got issues with China that are just seem to be perpetual. You know, the Olympics did not go well um, from a, you know, from, from a number of people watching point of view, from kind of the, just the view and the impressions point of view. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's a lot of questions about U.S. relations just all over the world. Um, so I understand on some level the Fed's um, desire not to move too quickly, but looking back, they should have been on the gas here um, some time ago because now we're looking at a one half of a percent rate hike in March and how fast is that going to be? Yeah, you're you're going to certainly see some slowing around the country. So I, I probably with housing, who the heck knows, you know, the housing market is crazy, but uh, so there are just two of the headlines uh, and some things to pay attention to. We're going to dig into that a little bit more when we go over our really great report from Prudential. So let's let's jump into the Ed Slot updates. Um, and the first one's from Ian Berger. Uh, so he writes about ERISA protection. So ERISA are um, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. I believe that's what it is. Um, so the ERISA plans or 401k plans, 403b plans, um, typical uh, company retirement plans, and ERISA is seen is seen as kind of the gold standard in, in protected assets and fiduciary responsibility. So we're, a lot of these fiduciary rules have have grown out of ERISA because when you're when you have um, a 401k plan as we do, we have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that plan is the best that we that can be for our employees. Um, just and and a lot of like I said, a lot of these rules that are now um, governing many financial planners and financial advisors, and hopefully all at some point. Um, really have grown out of this um, ERISA. So one of the things that ERISA allows is, and we're going to talk about this uh, in, in the financial planning section, is whatever money you roll over or have in an ERISA plan is creditor protected, 100% creditor protected. Um, if you roll that into an IRA, that the courts have, have shown that that follows, right? So you, you have $5 million, let's just say, and, they, and that, that that amount becomes uh, important in a second. If you have five million dollars, and that you can you roll that into an IRA, uh, you don't you don't give up creditor protection. It's not reduced. It's not eliminated. That follows that. Uh, the question here is: I am sixty six years old and live on Social Security and other retirement income. Additionally, I have about a half a million dollars in pre tax four fifty seven B funds. So four fifty seven plans are typically government plans that I do not need for current expenses. So he's got about $500,000 in this 457 plan that he doesn't need to cover current expenses. Are these funds in the pre-tax retirement accounts eligible for Roth conversions? This is a question to, that this is the, when people write in and ask questions, can I withdraw funds from a 457 account and deposit them in a Roth IRA? Must I have current compensation to do a Roth conversion? These are, this is a really good basic question that people get mixed up on Often they get mixed up on these rules. There's lots of different rules. And his, um, the, I'm sorry, her, this is Jane. Jane's two big questions are, I have a 457 plan. I don't need the income from it. I don't need to take any withdrawals. Can I convert it to a Roth IRA? And must I have current income to co compensation, she says, um, but income to convert to a Roth, right? So you have to have income to contribute to a Roth, but do you have to have income to convert to a Roth? I think you know the answer to this, but let me go on and read the answer. Assuming you are eligible to take a distribution from your 457 plan, those funds can be directly converted to a Roth IRA. You don't need to have current compensation to do a Roth conversion income. Of course, you will need to pay taxes on the amount you convert. Good question. Good question and good answer. All right. The next question is about a QCD, a qualified charitable distribution. Uh, we talked a lot about these. This is a great opportunity if you're charitably inclined to, to move money directly to a charity. You don't have to pay tax on that money. It doesn't, um, it doesn't have many of the same adjusted gross income or any of the adjusted gross income um, requirements that uh, a regular charitable contribution does. So um, it's a really great way if you're not going to use money in your IRA and you're going to you plan on leaving it to a charity, you can do it during your lifetime. 
can a QCD, this, uh, this writer asks, there's no name, can a QCD be made from a SEP or a simple IRA if the employer participant does not make a deductible contribution to the SEP or simple IRA during the tax year in which the QCD is made? So can you contribute? Can you do a qualified charitable distribution from a SEP or a simple plan uh, in a tax year that you're not making a deductible contribution? Alternatively, can a traditional IRA account be established as a receptacle for a trustee to trustee transfer? This person is paying attention, right? Uh, transfer of funds from the SEP or simple IRA followed by a QCD from the new traditional IRA account. Would the IRS successfully argue step transaction to prevent this planning strategy? This person may be a CPA. Uh, they don't say, but the answer is yes, you can do a QCD from a SEP IRA for a particular year, but only if you do not receive a contribution from, this, from the SEP for that year. This would be considered an inactive SEP. Um, even if you receive a SEP contribution, you could roll over or transfer SEP funds into a traditional IRA and then do a QCD, right? So simple to do from that IRA. This is a perfect, perfectly acceptable workaround and not considered a step transaction. The same rule applies to simple IRAs. However, you can only do a rollover or transfer from a simple to an IRA if you have participated in the simple IRA for at least two years. Simple plans are really, I, I'm not a fan, you know, the, I, I can't remember what the simple acronym stands for off the top of my head, but they're anything but simple and really unnecessary in my opinion. Uh, in today, because I, uh, 401ks are just so easy to, to uh, set up and administer, even for an individual, you know, they have these solo 401k plans. The next question or the next uh, article is just about spousal IRA contributions. And this is from Sarah, Sarah Brenner. The pandemic, pandemic has upended the workforce. Many workers lost jobs. So the, the, the question about this, uh, that, that really comes from this bit here is, if I'm not working, can I contribute to an IRA? Again, this, this is may, you might think, well, yeah, everybody knows, you know, the answer to that, but we're coming up on the time, you know, you have until the tax filing deadline to contribute to an IRA, traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. Uh, many people forget this and I'll remind them, you know, you can, you can do this and this. And they say, oh, you know what? I, I didn't remember that because my, my spouse doesn't, doesn't work. So, um, Many workers lost jobs. Some workers resigned by choice. Others were first forced to leave jobs due to childcare issues. If you're not working outside the home, you may believe you're ineligible to make an IRA contribution. You may think that because IRA contributions are based on taxable compensation, you are uh, personally, you personally have not been working. You are out of luck. Well, there's good news. If you're married, but not working, you may be able to make a contribution to your IRA based on your spouse's taxable compensation for the year. These IRA contributions are called spousal IRA contributions. And I'm sure she goes in to talk about uh, Roth also, but when you hear IRA in this example, think of traditional IRA and um, so pre-tax IRA and Roth after-tax IRA. Spousal IRA contributions can be a valuable tool if you're out of the workforce and are concerned about the impact this may have on your retirement savings. To do a spousal contribution, you make a contribution to your IRA based on your spouse's compensation. Your spouse can contribute to an IRA too. Um, I'm not going to read this entire thing to you. I'm just going to sum surmise, uh, you know, summarize this. You can, of course, do a spousal contribution if you're um, if you're not working. Say if I'm if I wasn't working, my wife was working, and uh, she she made enough to cover both both contributions. Right for us, seven thousand dollars a piece. Then we can make a contribution into an IRA. Now, of course, there are um, income limits on, on how much you can make into a uh, deductible IRA. So it may not make sense for us to do it if we earn too much money. And when you're talking, that's it for a traditional IRA. For a Roth IRA, you, you get phased out on how much you can put into a Roth IRA. So even though you can do a spousal contribution, if you have the income, if one of you has the income to do it, both of you can make the contribution you may hit up against the income limit. So you want to pay attention to that. And if you if you need to know what those income limits are, you can go to outerboroughwealth.com. You can go into the slot corner and I have all those charts listed there where you can see what they are. 
And if you'd like me to, I can share that with you. All right, so let's talk about um, this really great, let me just see if I have any questions. No questions, thank you. Let's talk about this really great analyst report um, that uh, came through from Robert De Lucia from Prudential. Now, again, I, I think we have some older Prudential annuities on the books still. I'm certain we do, actually. They used to have a 5% um, roll-up until age 90, I think, for death benefits. So I still have some of my um, uh, more seasoned clients, let's just say, uh, who are who still have these when they're just for death benefit purposes. So, uh, but from a, from a uh, fund point of view or other investment point of view, I don't have any Prudential in here. And, and uh, this isn't a recommendation to not invest in Prudential or invest in Prudential. This Robert uh, De Lucia is just the consulting economist for uh, Prudential, but I really enjoy his, um, his reports and his outlooks. And this one's going to take some time because it's pretty significant. So we're going to just settle in and spend, you know, five or 10 minutes talking about this. And then we're going to get into our financial planning topic. So uh, major conclusions he has. Uh, so I'm going to read through these. Investors should prepare for subpar rates of return over the next five years in virtually all asset classes. The economic and investment landscape will be challenged by a conf confluence of adverse underlying forces of both a cyclical and long-term structural nature. So forget that second, second, uh, second sentence for a second because you know it gets a little technical. But Pay attention to that first thing I said. Investors should prepare for subpar rates of return over the next five years in virtually all asset classes. So remember where we're coming from. Everything's been booming for many, many years. And I hate to tell you this, folks, but that boom has to end or at least level off at some point. What you hope for is leveling off and not correction, deep correction. I think we're going to hit correction probably, if not by the end of February, by the end of March. So correction territory is, you know, negative 10 plus percent. I, I don't, I'm not sure where we are right here today, um, but we're going to hit that uh, at some point fairly soon. The next five years is likely to witness a reversal of many of the established trends of the past 10 years for many areas of the economy and financial markets. Investors should expect a permanently higher rate of price and wage inflation compared with the past 20 years. Yes, makes perfect sense. The next five years should also be characterized by a permanently higher level of interest rates compared with the last 10 years. An upward shift in real wages, wages relative to the past 10 years, a gradual erosion in profit margins as wages rise faster than selling prices and more modest equity valuations. So equities are stock. So he's, he's expecting that companies are going to get more modest uh, uh, valuations because their, their cost, because employing people at a higher wage um, is they're going to increase, and they, you've, you've seen it already, the, the cost is increasing. It's hard to catch up with your the cost of goods uh, because we can only take so much as consumers. And we're seeing it really, really heavily. You know, I stopped in to get gas in my Jeep uh, yesterday at Costco, and I, I couldn't believe the line there on Monday afternoon. Now, I know it was a holiday, but, you know, I, it's, it's because it, the gas is cheaper there, but, you know, we're it's, it's just unfortunate what we're seeing. And, uh, and I really feel for the folks that, you know, we're hitting this, this, um, I, I keep using the term perfect storm, but very, very high inflation. I hope it starts waning. You know, if we see 8%, eight and a half percent next, next month, uh, at least, you know, or anything above a leveling off or a decrease, it's really going to be concerning, but, you know, higher interest rates, higher inflation, um, questionable market returns, and millions of people retiring every day. You know, I reminded myself, I went back and looked at some uh, charts this morning, and don't forget that Medicare is scheduled to run out of money in 2023. So that's a year from now. Social Security is right around the corner. We have all these headwinds anyway, and now, and these have been around for a while, um, and many of you have taken steps to overcome it uh, from an investment point of view and a planning point of view, but me, but the majority of folks out there have. There's still, you know, I, I it's it's got to be you are probably within ten percent, if not 
less than that of the retirees out there. People just aren't catching this yet. And there's many people out there that think that they've got enough saved for retirement. And there's just no chance uh, of them surviving retirement. So it's, uh, it's really a shame. But it really is a perfect storm that's brewing. Uh, and I don't want to be, listen, I don't want to sound the alarm, but we have to be concerned uh, when we're seeing the things that we're seeing and hearing um, analysts talk about five years, 10 years from now, you know, it, you've got to take measures and set yourself up again. If you're a client and we've already started doing the work, we've already laid that foundation. Uh, I'm just concerned about people out there that, that still haven't started that work. All right. Um, a, a central theme of my analysis is, is that the next five years could be one of the most challenging periods of investing in recent decades. Financial markets face powerful headwinds pertaining to growth, inflation, government policy, and valuation. Virtually all asset classes are overvalued to a greater or lesser extent. The lesson of history is clear. The starting price level or entry point is crucial for prospective investment returns. History clearly shows that expensive assets tend to generate subpar prospective returns when measured over many years. The weakest five-year period for stock investing was from 1999 to 2004, during which, uh, the time, during which time the return for the S&P 500 was a negative 2.5%. The worst five-year period for investing in long-term government bonds were from 1964 to 1969 with an annual return of negative 2.2. What does that mean to you? Almost nothing but giving you perspective uh, that we can see times when both the stock markets and the bond markets are down for a period, long period of time. So five-year period, 1999 to 2004, 1964 to 1969. Now he pulled out po pockets of time here to show you, you know, what the the worst periods of times are, but they could they collide and be together? Of course they could. The common denominator of each of these periods, uh, these episodes of weak returns was a starting point of overvaluation of each five-year period. You have to argue that you're, you know, there's not much argument that the stock market could be well overvalued. And the bond market prior to six months ago, man, maybe even today was also very overvalued. So starting point is crucial. There are numerous powerful structural changes currently underway that will profoundly impact the economy and financial markets over the next five years. While some of these potential trends are positive for the economy, uh, many are negative. Demographic feed factors are negative for the labor market. Slow growth in the working age population implies continued tightness in the labor market, suggested, suggesting that wage growth could remain elevated. So less people to fill roles, higher prices or higher wages, higher wages equals higher prices at some point. But in the, he's, uh, what he's positing is that in the meantime, that gap between higher prices and higher wages is going to mean less profit. So less profit doesn't directly affect you when it's the mom and pop next door, but when you're investing in stocks as a whole, you know, your returns are based on profit. And this is important, and I put this in bold. It can be useful for investors to take a step back from the routine emphasis on short-term investment performance and to contemplate a longer-term horizon that extends well beyond the next year to two. Using a five-year time horizon this this week's economic perspective, that's what the report uh, says, provides a summary of potential long-term investment returns by asset classes by exploring probable economic and policy trends that could unfold over in future years. So I'm going to go on here and read a couple of things. I just want to check in, see if we have any questions. Denise, I see your hand raised. If you have a question, if you want to type it into the Q&A that you see, I think I'm, I'm hitting it there uh, on your screen, and maybe it's over here. But um, uh, if... Uh, if you have a question, just type it in there. I just want to make sure I answer your questions. So here's, here's the major economic trend reversals that he talks about. A permanently higher rate of inflation compared to the last 20 years. Permanently higher rate of inflation compared to the last 10 years. Not transitory, permanently. A permanently higher level of interest rates compassed, compared with the past 10 years. So you might think that will, would be beneficial to you. You get higher interest rates. Listen, I remember when I was at Wachovia, um, we had, uh, we used a Vanguard tax-free money market fund that was paying anywhere from four and a half to 4.8% uh, on any time. Uh, money market fund, four and a half to 4.8% tax-free. Um, so that would be beneficial if we get back into there for, for an income point of view. 
there's always offsets to that. And that's a tough road to get there. And that will certainly take some time. An upward shift in real rate wages relative to the past 10 years. We talked about that. A gradual erosion of profit margins. A decline in equity valuations consistent with higher bond yields. Uh, a budget deficit likely to exceed 3.3% of our average of previous years. So that last one's very important too. So, um, you know, he goes on to talk about long-term structural changes, uh, shift in bargaining power, automation. So um, there's the discussion about, well, if, if we're having a difficult time with the labor market and we're, we're paying much higher wages than we were, um, many things are going to be automated. Right. So new systems are going to come out that are going to replace the individuals that we used to pay for. them. So that can be a positive, but it, there's also cost involved and time to put that together. He talks about the Infrastructure Act, how that's that could be beneficial. Uh, big government, a review of the history of national crises shows a tendency for the federal government to become more. Uh, uh, more involved and to assume a bigger role in economic affairs. All else equal big government is a negative for both economic growth and labor productivity. So um, I don't think uh, Mr. De Lucia from my past readings is, is a conservative. Um, I, he's just giving his economic opinion about what the effect of a larger government is historically uh, for both economic growth and labor productivity. And that's a negative effect. Um, chronic budget deficits, currently at 10% of GDP, the federal budget deficit could steadily decline over the next ten, uh, five years as the economy returns to full employment. However, the deficit is likely to remain above the levels of the past decade as a share of gross domestic product. The average size of the budget deficit was 3.3% during the five years ending in 2019. A level closer to 5% more, seems more likely for the next five years. Talks more about a shift to green energy, and that that's something that BlackRock is really uh, grabbing onto is you know that that net zero effect and direction. So um, I want to share this next chart with you. Just grabbing it in my notes here, and these are some rec some some predictions he's making over the next five years, uh, based on all this information of different asset classes. So let me just share it with you here. I'm seeing hands raised. Uh, just, um, I just want to make sure is is Q and A working okay? Just, uh, I guess somebody send me a a, a Q a, something in Q and A if you can, um, just to let me know, please. And if not. Uh, I guess I'm going to just ask you to send me an email and I'll check emails before we're done. All right. So let me share this section here. Okay. There's a Q and a Walter Paul test prediction is hard, especially about the future. Yes, it is Walter. Now let me, let me tell you since, uh, and Ger Gerard's asking, does cash make more sense in, in some, we're going to talk about that, but good questions. And, uh, Walter prediction is hard, especially about the future. <laughs> um, that is very true. Now, Listen, I am sharing this report with you. Again, it's not about should you be making investment choices or planning choices based on one person's report? No. Um, should you use it to open your mind and start thinking about these things? You know that we've been talking about portfolio changes for well over the past year. We've made some changes. We're going into 2022, looking at um, implementations with some closed end funds to give um, some, uh, some return even if the markets are, are declined or sideways. Um, and uh, you, 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 of course, make adjustments in your investments based on you know, what seems obvious, I think, in the economic direction. Could it be as difficult as Mr. De Lucia is saying? Not necessarily. Uh, we've been surprised on many times, you know, many times, but I think if you base your uh, foundation on what, what bad can happen and allow yourself to have room for growth. That's where it seems to make sense. Um, you know, that's, I've, I've, I've dabbled in, you know, trying to, well, should we move things to cash to, to move things to gold or, and not even personally, but working with uh, very well seasoned uh, professional money managers around the world who did those tactical shifts. And it almost never works. Uh, but what I have found that works is um, if you allow yourself your level of protection that you need and you allow yourself growth, then you're going to find your balance in the middle. Um, 
And that is not just a 60-40 portfolio. Uh, I don't believe that just maintaining a 60-40 portfolio works for most people, again, psychologically. Um, I believe that it can work mathematically. Uh, but it, I, you, know, you, have, you have personal behavior that gets involved. So Gerard, cash can make sense in the short term, for sure. Um, the short-term portfolios that we have, you know, maintain 30, you know, a third to 50% or more in cash. Um, and then we fan out more aggressive as we go. So it can make sense. But yeah, um, I don't want you to, I don't, I share these reports to you again, to give you insights. And when we find positives, you know, some, some people are very uh, positive. I share those as well. I just wanted to open your mind and allow for discussion that we can have about your plans and investment um, uh, and future investments. So let me just share with you here. So raise your hand for me if you see something uh, that says asset class next five years, previous 10 years. Uh, very good, thank you. Let me clear these questions. All right, Oof, we gotta get moving. All right, so I'm gonna, uh, I think I'm gonna stop after this uh, for this section, but here's some recommendations uh, or recommendations. Here's some uh, looks that he has over the next five years. So global equities, equities are stocks. And you can see US uh, stocks, US large cap, small cap, international, emerging. Um, emerging markets are smaller economies. So China, even though it's a huge um, uh, country, large country in the world, um, it's still considered an emerging market. Uh, US government bonds, corporate bonds, high yield bonds, emerging market debt. So that's also bonds, commercial property, global commodities. You can see how, how it continues. Now over here on the right are the previous 10 years, 2011, 2021. And you'll see how everything, re, um, the, the average over that period of time, right? From 13.3, the highest here, US large, uh, large cap, right? So large companies, stocks, 16 and a half percent seems to be the largest. So here's what he thinks we're going to see, you know, these more modest returns, one negative area here over the next five years. So not terrible, just not gangbusters like we've seen. And, and I think, I think if you polled anybody, I don't think anybody expects this, right? It's just shaking out this, um, shaking out the, the, the difficult kind of news that we see, you know, again, Russia, uh, Ukraine, uh, CPI, that's the difficult part. Could it take a year and a half to shake this out? Sure, it could. Yeah, we could, we, we may have to buckle in for a while. But if we look at, you know, looking back, and we're in 2026 and we see these average returns, you know, I wouldn't be unhappy with that. Um, would I prefer to see this? Well, sure, but I wouldn't necessarily be unhappy with that. All right, let me stop my share there. Uh, I have a question. Let me just see. Is there an inflation prediction that goes uh, with this table? Are there real or nominal returns? Um, so I'm going to have to look back. The, he, he definitely has some inflation predictions. I'm going to have to look back um, at, the, um, uh, at the sources in that article uh, for you, Walter. I may just be able to send it to you as well. So send me an email as a reminder, please, and I will, um, I will do that for you. Just pop it back to my notes. Let's see where we are. All right, good. So that's it for um, the analyst report. Uh, again, really, really good article from Robert DiLucia from uh, Prudential. I think that uh, I think that uh, again, not not something that I don't want to want you to let it keep me up at night. Right? Don't let it keep you up at night. We've got tools to look at these things, to stress test, see where um, see where we can plug in gaps and holes, and and really, if you're a client, we've already begun the work. If not you know, set the foundation. So um, I hope that if you're not a client um, that you've started and you've been following this, you know, we, we've been talking about this for a long time. You know, the answer to these issues is, say it with me, asset allocation, principal protection, and account uh, segmentation. Uh, those three things together can really help give you some um, stability in these difficult times. The most challenging thing with this, uh, uh, this transition has been not to be able to just pop in and see client accounts and see what's going on because we're kind of we're we're kind of in a blackout period when we're transferring things over, so we can no longer see the accounts at Kestra NFS and we can't and they're not quite here at Schwab. So that's been difficult over the last week for me, especially as we're seeing markets decline. Uh, not that we would make any trading moves uh, based on what the market's doing, but I do like to um, to take a look and just stay 
on top of what's going on in individual accounts. Of course, we know the securities and the selections that we put in there, but it's, it's important to see it on the individual account um, um, aspect too, because we do have different purchase periods for each one of those securities. All right, quickly, we're running out of time here. Hopefully this won't take long, but I hope you all stay with me. Um, all right, let's go to the whiteboard. I'm gonna share my whiteboard with you. This is a relatively simple one, so we should be able to get through it quickly over the next 10 minutes. But um, this is about IRAs. And what the heck are the differences between these IRAs? So I'm not talking about, everybody see my whiteboard? Raise your hand, please, if you can see my whiteboard. Yes, perfect. I'm not talking about the difference between traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs. We, I, you know, we've talked about that a lot. I'm happy to talk about it another time. I'm talking about just when you're seeing different types of IRAs, what do they mean and what is the effect? What is the taxation effect and the creditor protection effect? That is really what we're focused on. So I'm not going to, I'm not even going to get into the, ta the definitions of each one. I'm going to show you what we, what we usually see. We see just traditional IRA. We see rollover IRA. And that is, that's usually a big distinction. You know, the traditional IRA is a rollover IRA. And then we also see contributory. IRA. So there can often be confusion about this. Well, wait a minute. If I'm if I have my accounts at Vanguard and I roll them into, um, well, I, if I have them in my 401k plan, and I roll them into, uh, so here we go, 401k, and I roll them into a traditional IRA. Shouldn't I really roll them into a rollover IRA? So here's my options. But what if I want to keep, what if I'm still working and I want to keep contributing? Should I put it into a contributory IRA? Or maybe I can't. Maybe this is just for the $7,000 if I'm greater than 50 that I can put it into the contributory IRA. And maybe I maintain this into the rollover IRA because that's how it should go. And don't I have to maybe wait a period of time? The answer is it doesn't matter. It really, really doesn't matter from a taxation point of view. So whatever, as long as you, first of all, you, you can't mess a rollover up from a 401k to, a, um, to an IRA. You really can't mess that up because the 401k providers, the, the custodians of your 401k won't let you. They're going to issue a check to um, Jane Smith for the benefit of, um, um, excuse me, not even Jane Smith. Uh, <laughs> um, they're going to, they're going to issue that to, um, you know, whoever in our case, Charles Schwab for the benefit of Jane Smith, Jane Smith may get a check for a million dollars. Can she put it in her checking account? No. Can she, you know, do any, can she put it into her investment account with Charles Schwab? No, it's going to have to be an IRA and you really can't mess that up. Where you see people messing it up is when they take that 60-day rollover distribution from their IRA and try to put it into, uh, they put it into their checking account or they hold it for too long and then they try to put it into another IRA. Um, so it can be a, a kind of a bookkeeping thing for you if you want to take your 401k or take your IRA that you have at Vanguard and move it into a rollover IRA so you can track it yourself and you can say, well, okay, I had this. This was a million dollars at at uh, my 401k, or this was a million dollars at my Vanguard, and now I've moved it over to this rollover IRA, and I want to see if in three years this is worth 1.2 million dollars, for example, so I can track it. That's fine. You can do that. You can also do it if you do it to a traditional IRA. You can also do it if you do a um, contributory IRA. From a from a tax point of view. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter because they all come out the other way on the other side. Distributions are taxed at ordinary income rates. Now, one of the things you do want to track are after tax contributions, and that's separate. So, after tax contributions, either in an IRA or a 401k, 
you do want to track that. But again, it doesn't really matter what type of account that goes in. Um, but some people will say, well, I want to take these after con tax contributions, carve them out and put them in here just so I keep track of them. But you should be keeping track of them um, separately. You or your accountant should be keeping track of them because people do end up paying tax twice on these sometimes because they just haven't kept track. So after tax contributions is very, very important. From a taxation point of view, so these types of different accounts just don't matter. They've all become, you know, custodians call them different things. Um, Schwab seems to, def to, to default to um, contributory IRA. They, they have under traditional IRA, they have like three different categories. So it really doesn't, really doesn't matter. So it's really a custodian based thing. Now, what about creditor protection? That's another big thing. If you're sued, can they uh, can the people suing you attach your 401k or your IRA? So we know that I have this great chart again from the slot group. Um, there are bankruptcy protections and creditor protections uh, for 401ks and IRAs. So we know that funds rolled over. I'm just going to highlight this here. To a Roth IRA or Roth IRA from an employer plan, that is anything in a 401k, 403b, SEP, simple, et cetera, 100% federal protection, even after rolling it to an IRA. This used to be a lot of discussion. We know that for, we know that these plans here are 100% protected from bankruptcy and, and, and um, creditor protected uh, as, as long as it's in the 401k or the ERISA plan, right? These are all ERISA plans. Uh, once there was discussion, once it's rolled over to an IRA, what happens? So 100% uh, federal protection, federal protection, even after rolling to an IRA. And then you'll see here protection based on uh, individual state law. And we're gonna talk, to, talk about that as well. That's non-bankruptcy uh, protection. So you know, you get in a car accident, you don't have adequate insurance, the neighbor sues you or your, your, the person sues you, uh, can it be subject to um, uh, attachment? Hold on one second. Um, I was just looking at a uh, question, Gerard, I'll come back to that. All right, so, and you'll see here, and if you want, this isn't on my website, but if you want a copy of this, just email me and I can send you a copy of this um, this chart. Uh, you know, there's so many great charts on the slot website. I just could not include them all on my, I guess I could, but take a tremendous amount of room. Um, now you'll see here, traditional IRAs, so contributory dollars and earnings. So money that you've put in, let me just highlight that because I don't like the way that's showing. So highlight. Traditional IRAs. So these are that. now we talked about here funds that you roll over from a 401k retirement plan, 100% protected. Uh, contributory IRA, well, up to 1,362,000. And this changes uh, every year, just about, if not every year, uh, based on federal uh, inflation adjusted cap. So 1,362,000. So this came about because a, a, a federal judge said, well, we calculate that the average person really can't have more than a million dollars in um, uh, in their IRAs between contributions, you know, at seven thousand dollars a year. And uh, we're talking about the, what you could put in, going all the way back to when IRA started, what you contribute in there, and, and what growth could be. So it's 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 likely that the average would be about a million dollars that someone could have in there, uh, and then they started inflating that. So right here, this is as of twenty twenty one. It's $1,362,800. So that's the level of protection for contributory IRA. So if you wanted to separate your IRAs and say, going back to the beginning and say, well, I know there's no tax different, but I want to have these funds here that are subject to this cap in a contributory IRA. And these funds here in a rollover IRA well, then you could do that. You could say, all right, well, I know because I take a, a I, I'm worried. This is one of the things that keeps me up at night that I'm going to get sued somehow. I don't have adequate insurance and I want to make sure that my IRA assets are protected. That's something you could do, or you could just purchase adequate insurance. Um, so now the next part is here. So how, Mark, how do we determine based on individual state law, individual state law? You'll see, right? So anything that comes from an ERISA plan, like a 401k, 
uh, with at least one employee other than the spouse, 100% protected, also 100% federally protected here for creditors. Um, so these are similar, these two. Solo 401k. So that's if, if it was just me and I had a 401k, you know, you can go through each one of these 100 federal protection based on state law. So now what about state law? Well, Shannon Evans, a couple of years ago, she's Shannon is not affiliated with the slot group, but she does. She, she does a presentation every one of our um, every one of our meetings. So twice a year, you know, when we have our education updates, Shannon is uh, always gets up and uh, does these great presentations. And a few years ago, she did one that had to do with the the state laws around IRA creditor protection. And she put together this chart. Shannon is a really uh, fun individual. We have spent some time together outside of the meetings. She's just one of those crazy smart people. And um, she's based in um, Las Vegas, but um, really, really beneficial. So let's look at some of these, the states we deal with. Pennsylvania's right here. 100% protection on your IRAs. That includes contributory IRAs and rollover IRAs, right? But not within one year, not including rollovers, contributions greater than 15,000. Um, so this is a little confusing. I wouldn't pay attention to that. Not including rollovers, contribution greater than 15,000 in any one period year or fraudulent conveyance. So you can look up the statute here. Uh, it's a little clearer if you just look up the statute rather than Shannon's notes, but 100% with some really obscure exceptions. Uh, New Jersey is another big one. Let's look at New Jersey. Pretty clear, 100%. Florida is another big state where we have many clients. Uh, let's see, Florida, 100%. Arizona is another one. Um, I'm just trying to think of some others. The, the uh, I was about to say the Carolinas, 100%. So again, I'm happy to send this to you if, uh, if you want a copy of this so you can see it for yourself. So the moral story here, folks, is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it's titled. If you want to separate it for some reason, you can. Um, it's, it may make things more difficult from a uh, segmentation point of view, from the account segmentation point of view. And, and, but, um, but it really doesn't matter. It's a great question. You should be asking questions like this. When, you are when you're opening accounts and rolling things over, you should be asking questions like this because what if it did matter? What if your rollover from your 401k to a contributory IRA and you rolled over $3 million and for some crazy reason that now reduced your, your creditor protection down to $1.3 million? Well, what the heck? Wouldn't you be getting concerned about that or isn't something that's, but that's not the case, but you should be asking those questions. They're great questions to ask. Don't ever apologize for asking questions. It's, it's, uh, it's things that we, unfortunately, not the majority of advisors don't know this off the top of their head or easily accessible because they're not one of us 400 who study this and work with this every day and are part of the, the uh, Master Leap uh, Advisor Group with Ed Slot. And that's really unfortunate, but you should be asking these questions. And I applaud Joe for asking and for giving me a topic to talk about today. So I'm going to stop share. It's a little over 11 o'clock. I'm sorry I ran over. I thought this was going to be quick and uh, uh, short. Okay, Gerard asked one question. Gerard asked, in-service withdrawals would allowed, would you consider moving into Roth? Where in-service withdrawals allowed, would you consider, well, Gerard, I got to say, like every time, it depends. So Gerard's saying, if I can do in-service withdrawals from my 401k, should I consider rolling it to a Roth? Well, first of all, you, you probably want to first take it to a traditional IRA and then have a schedule to convert it to a Roth. And you know that anything that you don't, that isn't mathematically ideal for your taxable bucket, your tax deferred bucket should be in Roth or cash value life insurance in that right side of the ledger. Um, so I appreciate you teeing that up for me, but yes, it should be there. Um, anything, anything, uh, that's not going to make you tax efficient should be over to that tax free section. Great question, everybody. I hope that was helpful. I'm sorry. We went over a little bit. We had a lot to cover. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next week and enjoy your two, 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 two Tuesday. Have a great day. Take care.